Yeah, and I guess um, and now we're on. How about that? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Frank Chaparro, Director of News at The Block, and we have a, an excellent panel for you folks today. Enterprise blockchain calls for immediate changes in future implementations. And we have a star-studded panel. We're all, um, we're all well acquainted with one another. I'm very excited to, it's almost like a reunion, so to speak. Many of us have known each other for quite some time. We have Rebecca Astler, Director of Product Management at Unbound. This is um, Rebecca's second or third time with us. I'm not exactly sure. I'm not keeping track that closely. And we have Omid Malekin, Adjunct Professor, Columbia Business School, and a consultant at City Ventures. And Adam Mastrelli, Digital Assets and Blockchain at IBM. Yeah, long, long, long time listener, first time caller, Frank. Welcome to the show. <laughs> We're happy to have you, and we're happy to have everyone. We are going to be unpacking some of the um, interesting uh, things that have been going on in the digital asset space over the last couple of weeks, specifically um, on the enterprise financial services side, and, and these folks really have their finger on the pulse. Um, thank you, Tino, for joining us. And welcome, everybody. So I guess to kick things off, you know, it's been a unique time for the cryptocurrency market. We are seeing echoes of the heady days of 2017. Price for Bitcoin is in a good spot right now. And it looks like banks are leaning into the market more than ever. But in many respects, from my seat, it, it seems like not that different from 2017, 2018, when all the banks were working on different derivatives products and, and rumored trading desks. Um, and so I guess to kick the conversation off at a high level, from, from the perspective of um, where you guys are working, how different is this 2020 cycle? We're seeing JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, um, reconfigure, beef up their, their respective blockchain units. But how is that different from the hype cycle of, of your? We'll start with Oh, man. Thanks, Frank. Hi, everyone. Uh, first, I should give the usual boring disclaimer that this is my opinion and not that of anybody else. Um, I think that one of the biggest differences is that Bitcoin did not go away, which kind of sounds funny today, but it wasn't that long ago that Nouriel Roubini was testifying to Congress that you know, it's going to go to zero. And that was a view that was shared by a lot of people. But as brutal as the winter, the crypto winter after 2018 was, you know, the 70, 80, 90 percent correction in a lot of coins and tokens, the fact that it survived that uh, and, and in some ways um, the ecosystem has grown substantially since then has changed the tone of a lot of different enterprises towards both Bitcoin and the technology that this is not some plaything for weird libertarian anarchist cypherpunks. This is a legitimate technology that has actually proven itself and it's proven to be highly resilient uh, to things like massive price corrections. So I think that makes enterprises more likely to decide to do something with it. Sorry, just trying to just was figuring out how to unmute myself there for a second. Um, and if I mute one of you guys in, in over the course of this thing, just let me know. I, I've I've been I've done that by mistake a few times uh, during some of these webinars. Um, you make a, you make a good point. You know, it, it's definitely we're we're still around. Noriel Rabini, I think, the other day said that um, he actually sees Bitcoin as a potential store of value, which is a far cry from the sinners in the hands of an angry God-esque approach he took to this market. Um, but I guess to sort of laser in a bit more on, on the bank specifically, what is different um, about what they're doing now? I kind of alluded to it. It seems more about blockchain than trading these assets themselves. Maybe a little bit more about custody. You have Onyx at JP Morgan. They've reportedly been speaking with cryptocurrency firms about custody. 
And then Goldman seems to be taking a more digital asset approach versus a, a cryptocurrency trading approach. Um, Rebecca Unbound works with a lot of these firms. Citi is an investor, for instance, in the company. Um, what, what looks different from your perspective? So we've seen a few changes since I would say, even our last conversations a few months ago and certainly compared to 2018. One is the pace of things. Uh, most of our, I would say, new customers are customers from the last six months. So they've been kind of sitting, waiting for the regulators to say their opinion or state their regulations or guidelines. And since the various regulators are now more at ease with uh, safeguarding cryptocurrencies, just as an example, you see the banks uh, pretty much moving projects from the uh, labs, one would say, into actual production. <clears throat> I mean, safeguarding cryptocurrencies, that's one thing. Another thing is the maturation of use cases, <clears throat> of, uh, example, clearing and settlements behind the scenes of derivatives or even movements between branches of banks. <clears throat> So these did not need the regulators, I would say, approvals. But we see, I would say, the various banks moving those use cases again from the laboratories mm -hmm. onto the production uh, floor. Uh, whether this is uh, trading, whether this is clearing settlement, whether it is custody. So two things, maturation of use cases and actual very fast moving compared to two years ago. What are some of those use cases that have moved closer to the forefront? Uh, so we see the clearing and settlement. This is something that is very easy to move from the lab, I would say, rooms onto the forefront uh, without disclosing any names. Um, quite a lot of banks are now using blockchain instead of SWIFT to move messages between them, specifically between the branches of the same bank and now starting to move uh, messages between banks. So this is a new thing. It saves the money. It is much more, I would say, modernized. Um, many advantages, I would say, you know, integrity, uh, transparency of data, and of course, much more cost effective. Uh, even though Swift is, is a very respectable type of infrastructure, no one would ever deny that. And of course, the trading and custody of assets moving on uh, much faster than two years ago, but uh, still slow compared to the, I would say, external service providers, but much faster. Like, uh, we have customers that have signed in, in the last three months, and we've been working with them for two years now, waiting, negotiating, coming back, going, you know, uh, back and forth, pretty much like dancing tango or something. And in the last three months, we've signed uh, quite a few of them. Yeah, and, and it's it's interesting considering how slow moving bankers are. They're not known for moving fast, and they're definitely not known for dancing the tango. Oh, man, I'm going to kick it to you, but I want to get Adam's perspective in a second because it's something that we've talked about almost ad nauseum at this point. When we think about the speed at which these banks are moving into the market or how they're wading into the market, to what degree is it being driven by regulatory clarity versus them feeling a bit of a fire under their tuchus from, from their competition. Yeah. I think the regulatory clarity cannot be overstated in financial services, particularly in the aftermath of 2008. So when, when you were talking about moving fast, like in, in the technology domain, it's move fast and break things, but bankers are not supposed to break things. Um, and a lot of times that implies working closely with regulators to develop something. Uh, and uh, as we all know, a lot of the regulatory frameworks, well, they, they didn't exist. They still don't exist in many jurisdictions, but we do have our things like the OCC letter, um, right? like the what in reference to crypto custody, for example, um, that it is doable. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that you can just launch it tomorrow, right? Because they're all the, you got to uh, dot the I's and cross the T's. But I think the fact that for as far as large financial institutions are concerned, their regulators are in different jurisdictions are giving tacit approval to begin doing something. And then to your, the first part of your question, you do have smaller financial institutions like Fidelity 
uh, making waves. And I think the competitive pressure from that is real. Mm -hmm. Is that your perspective, Adam? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like the difference, the just everything around maturity of, of infrastructure. I mean, my big question, you know, we talked to, so what is this, 92 of the top 100 banks, 85% of, uh, of credit card transactions run on IBM systems. So all of these big financial institutions, including insurance, run on our stuff. So the big question we always ask initially is, are you interested in reducing risk or creating it? And the answer is, um, I mean, smiling and Rebecca, the answer is usually reducing it. So mm -hmm. from 2017 through 2020, the, I mean, it is it is still it is much different, but there is still a long way to go for a lot of these big banks and institutions to feel super, super comfortable. I mean, from just from policy engines and um, different things around infrastructure. Um, so, yo, sorry, please, Rebecca. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, keep going. Oh, sorry, just so that that part plus the what's different about 20, 2020 uh, aspect is we have a captive audience at home watching, you know, money printer go burr um, for a really long time. Plus, it's not we're not raising capital to kind of like start projects with crazy names. We're now like, oh, we're raising and it's happening fast with primitives that are basically, as you said, I like the, uh, I haven't used Tukas in a while, Frank. I will I will take you up on that. Put it in, your, put it in your back pocket. Stealing Tukas. But, um, right, I mean, now you're doing financial primitives. So if, and uh, Brian Brooks does a really good job of expressing this in, in his um, uh, OCC kind of conversations is banks are like, do, banks are not big things that just, are existing forever. They do financial services. And if you can have financial services provided in a secure, mature, faster, better way, the people will go, you know, this will, you will vote with your feet or vote with your dollar, or vote with your, whatever that's called. So I think it's, they're getting, fires are lit under their tukas. Tukas? Mm -hmm. Tukas. Mm -hmm. Tukai. 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 The appropriate me. plural. Exactly. Um, it's interesting. So, you know, when we when we sort of did the preparatory call for this, one point that you brought up, Omid, was the fact that, you know, for for many years, um, since maybe the inception of, of Bitcoin and DLT, banks have sort of used the um, regulatory um, excuse as the as a main reason to to not get into it. And they've and this is part of a broader story of them kind of trying to sit on their hands to avoid anything that could either a disintermediate them or or b um get them involved in things that uh, might be too risky is that needle shifting are they are they waking up to the fact that they um maybe need to stop being asleep at the wheel yeah because to expand the domain a little bit right let's bring fintechs into the equation now Banks have been seeding ground to fintechs for a long time now in areas like merchant processing, for example, certain kinds of digital payments. Uh, and the other thing that we've seen in recent years is that fintechs or some of them are going diving like headfirst into crypto with PayPal being the latest example. Mm -hmm. So there too, it arises this question of even if you would not like for this to be something that you have to grapple with. And even if, to be fair, it's a, it's harder for the banks to grapple with it than it is for some startup out of Silicon Valley with like 12 employees and no, no fear of God slash regulators. But if they're going to start competing on the consumer front, possibly on the enterprise front, um, that also moves the needle because you've already ceded terrain to them in some areas. But crypto is still totally greenfield, right? Like there is no financial services company that can lay any major claim on anything having to do with crypto yet. Mm -hmm. What's going to change that? Well, I think things like the PayPal news, right? like what we're seeing now is on the fintech side, you have traditional financial system fintechs, uh, that, the companies that did payments are moving into crypto, PayPal, Square, uh, Revolut are perfect examples. And then you also have crypto native companies like say Coinbase and Circle moving into payments mm -hmm. with stable coins and things like whether it's it's supporting DAI or USDC. So what we're seeing now from the more technologically oriented companies is that they're moving towards this vision where you get all of this, right? You got your Bitcoins, 
you got your dollars in the banking system maybe you got your tokenized dollars possibly someday cbdc yeah and the ubiquity of that is very appealing to me as a user as a consumer right? it's like yes give me all of those plus my crypto kitties in one wallet and i'm a happy man um so large financial institutions aka banks who today still have significant client bases provide lots of services they need to establish some kind of a beachhead in this coming future well yeah frank let me just add to that this is where unbound and this is why we like working with unbound right i mean basically what if you have an, an american express card you know what, what do they say so you're not responsible for fraudulent charges right it's pii data right the capital one hacks i mean paige thompson has these you know uh, she has pii data okay you're not responsible great i'm not responsible i have fdic insurance awesome Somebody has your keys. Okay, my keys, my crypto. Now this is a big, big problem. So they have to get it right the first time. And that's why Unbound, that's why we partner with Unbound. And that's why people like that story, right? Because it, it is very clear that you have to get bearer assets right. Um, you know, there's no backseas. Yeah. Some, some version of that. Can't call up the CEO of uh, Bitcoin. Uh, right, exactly. I want the CEO of Bitcoin on the line now, kid. Right, get him right, on. Immediately. I want right. that on my desk right now. So. <laughs> so if, yeah, I, if I may add and actually, actually echo what just Adam and I uh, said, but from the infrastructure, I would say, uh, point of view, what we see is that banks and I would say other enterprise grade type of financial institutions are ask, actually imitating what they're getting with the traditional fiat asset classes, whether these are equity or stocks or commodities. They're pretty much imitating what they have their approval wise, policies wise, workflow wise, getting the KYC and the AML engines integrated. And therefore, you have pretty much the same processes, the same workflows on the, I would say, different asset classes. And now that we're trading Bitcoin, just as an example, a simply a different new type of asset class, but with the same processes. And this adds up to PayPal getting into the picture and Coinbase, et cetera, and the regulator are more at ease with uh, bank safeguarding assets. You're getting this very much comprehensive picture of banks able to leverage their own existing systems, I would say, with an add-on of how you manage keys, because this is what you have to do with blockchain assets. But keeping the regular, I would say, comfort zone of processes, workflows, uh, the regular AML officers being, you know, just approving now transactions that are of a different asset class. So it's much easier today, I would say, infrastructure-wise when comparing it to 2018 or 2017. So, you know, that adds up to the convenience level of everyone. There's also <laughs> other points of penetration, right? It's not just Bitcoin, it's, you know, CBDCs, stable coins, all of which bring to the table their own value proposition for a financial services firm. When we spoke, I think it was last week, right? We talked about how, rather we talked about the question of, and we are always thinking about what's good for Bitcoin. Is, is X good for Bitcoin? Is the vaccine good for Bitcoin? At least in our weird little community. But I think in, in all seriousness, you could make the argument that um, banks being interested in either CBDCs or stable coins could be good for Bitcoin because of the ease at which it would enable them to then migrate into these other corners. And, and I'd be curious to get the perspective on the tech side of what that looks like. Maybe we can, we can kick it to you, Rebecca, and then move to Adam. But if you have a, a bank like JPM and Goldman, very interested in, in working with, with sovereigns on CBDCs or building out their own stablecoin infrastructure, how does that then parlay into them doing anything remotely close to this weird world of cryptocurrencies. So actually, I double checked it today, and most of the uh, stable coins are actually working on Ethereum uh, blockchain. I was pretty much actually surprised to see that most of them are doing so. So infrastructure wise for us as a signing engine, it doesn't really matter. Uh, at the end of the day, it's pretty much signing an elliptic curve of, of the same type as it would be of Ethereum for that matter. But you are absolutely right that it adds another assurance level, even though they're just 5% uh, of the market, having just 5%, 5.21 by, by the way, just to be precise, of all the cryptocurrencies. And Bitcoin, just to compare, is 62.4% out of the entire market. So 
I think they're making so much more noise than they're actually contributing to the actual, I would say, volume of the market, but they're adding another convenience level because these are stable coins as opposed to so-called volatile Bitcoin. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll add in and say that on the infrastructure side, the big thing is like who controls the keys. So um, the reason that like 2017 and Gen 1 doesn't work is because service banks are not going to let service providers hold the keys. Yeah. So now we move forward and banks, right, with w when working with infrastructure, they're like, I get control of my keys, right? That's what that's what we're partnering when we partner with Unbound uh, to do is like you control your keys. Now about stable coins, and that makes everybody's life a lot easier. Around stable coins, this is a massive ramp up to this ecosystem. Um, I think it, you know, it would be. Um, I, I agree with Brian Brooks again on this. I feel like I'm his fanboy right now, but um, it, he's some semblance of he does not think that a, a Fed um, a Fed coin will be better. He would say have it you know, competing for private company stable coins, much like their technology companies. And, and the signpost will be, if you have the Fed do a wallet directly to Adam, this completely is the, the beginning of the end. If you, if you follow that logic down to the end of the fractional reserve banking system, because, uh, you know, even China will not do that. They'll do DCEP into banks. Um, whereas if you do it directly to my wallet, now I'm, I'm, the Fed is competing against um, banks. So um, uh, stable coins is a big on ramp, but um, I would be, I think as far as a digital, uh, like a, a CBDC in the United States, and then we could talk about all the different regulations around the world in a second, but um, there's a lot, a, a lot to think about there. How does a bank break into that market? Maybe is it the banks that are going to sort of partner with these different governments and building this out? Or is it going to be more like third party providers that they work with like an unbound? Um, but there's definitely an appeal, I would think, to want to get into this, into this action. What do you think? Yeah. Ahmed? Well, let's go back to the fundamentals. What is a bank? Banks are institutions of trust. Right? Like it, it's in the name, it's in the architecture, the columns, the logos. And historically, they have served that purpose. It's transitioned over time, like physical trust and the vault or safe deposit box used to be perhaps more important than it is today. Then it moved to trust in preservation of ledgers and whatnot. And whatever one's opinion of certain issues, the financial crisis and whatnot, historically, that's the role that banks play in society. In crypto, whichever variation of it you take, if you take Bitcoin, private stable coins, tokenized securities, CBDCs, um, they still need someone to play that role. It still changes. I mean, it just changes. Right? It's like for all the talk about the decentralization that blockchain technology and the like and, and cryptographic keys make possible, what we've seen in Bitcoin is that the system ends up re-centralizing anyway. Right? Like in Bitcoin, it re-centralized around exchanges, miners, custodians. And that's because that's very convenient, liquidity reasons, et cetera. So all of these different uh, domains, I think a similar phenomenon will take place. And one of the fundamental areas will be key management. Because right? I think what we're all saying is that this key-based world, cryptographic-based world is better than what used to be in place before it for any kind of asset. But whether it's your Bitcoins, whether it's your uh, Fed tokens, or whether it's your digital collectibles, I think as this becomes a bigger part of all of our lives, you're going to want someone to help you protect your keys and to protect your assets, mm -hmm. particularly if you're a corporation. Right? Like no CFO in their right mind is going to want to be the CFO of a business that is responsible for all of its own assets, some of which are bearer assets. So I think going forward, the fundamental opportunity for institutions of trust like banks is this custody slash key management domain. Yep. Is that what's driving a lot of these? And it's probably an obvious answer, but we've seen PayPal in talks with uh, a number of different crypto firms. We know that BitGo is one of them. I've heard inklings of rumors about Bact being another. They're probably, they've, they've at least talked with 10 plus firms if we're going off of Bloomberg's reporting. Um, and it's interesting because it's a business that is fairly unsexy if we think about some of the most 
unappealing, boring firms in the cryptocurrency market. It is probably, with all due respect, the custodians. But this this notion of finding, um, you know, uh, the expertise to handle and and execute on key management and storage is probably the most important part to do anything else. Right. And so, well, obviously, we're seeing that play out in in the M and A arena. How do you how do you execute on that properly? Who's going? Is it going to be a winner take all situation? Um, is it going to be something um, where banks are relying on third parties like they do with other non differentiated things like we see in fintech and beyond? Um, what's your take, Rebecca? Well, we see the market evolving. This is an interesting question. Thank you, Frank. I've been doing what I've been doing now for a few years now, key management wise. This is the first time that there is a real mar market fit as far as uh, with blockchain. It's a cryptographic market. You cannot do without managing and protecting keys. And what we've seen in the market that three years ago, people were pretty much like opening this company, even young entrepreneurs and building their own key management systems. And now we don't see that anymore. People have acknowledged the fact that they need an external service provider that is an expert on that. Whether they're choosing um, multi-sig such as BitGo would be offering or whether they would be choosing Unbound and IBM together or separately, that's another question. I'm not getting into that now. Uh, obviously, I'm representing Unbound, so I do believe that MPC would be the answer and therefore would take over the world sooner or later. But uh, no more building on your own. We don't see that anymore. People are acknowledging the fact that keys are very sensitive. Uh, hackers are very much uh, of experts. Uh, they're learning each day new stuff. Um, and protecting the keys is your single point of failure, no matter what expertise, financial, consulting, identity management, whatever it is you're bringing to the table, at the end of the day, if you're not protecting the keys and you're not preventing that single point of failure, by the way, not just stealing the key, but only just to see it because you don't, in blockchain, you have to protect from uh, misuse of the key, not just stealing it. If you're not doing so in a, in a good enough manner, you'll be losing your assets. And when you're protecting your customer's value, you must do so. You must protect the keys. This notion of sort of not going it alone, though, seems new in terms of enterprise financial blockchain, right? You, know, you have a lot of folks trying to um, build out either their own stable coin or their own enterprise, enterprise blockchain solution that's private. Um, and, and you have Gartner mentioning that the current enterprise blockchains are, are obsolete, right? Um, according to Gartner, the demand, or rather the, the sort of um, the, the number or the percentage of enterprise blockchain platforms that will require replacement to remain competitive, secure, and avoid obsolescence stands at 90%. Yeah. So what, what does that mean? For, for the market, are people finally waking up to this idea that you know you can't really the the sort of first implementation was wrong, and now we need to move on and, and reconfigure. Well, yeah, I mean, I'll take this one. I think it's it's a, a lot of it is like um, internet versus intranet. I mean, we say this all the time, right? It's kind of like um, if I, my Adam, Rebecca, Frank, and Omid um, are all in a in a smaller network, right? And now Adam needs to prove that he has an NFT. He can either say Rebecca, Omid, and Frank trust me, or he can show it on chain. And I think what you'll see is you'll see these little, um, much like you saw with the state of New York do with PPE, and that's something that we do with right. The state of New York will work with regional. Right, a regional group. Wow, I really got cloudier on here when I said that. That was um, so reference. So um, I think it's going to be a little bit of both, and you'll have to have financial institutions specifically um, be able to play. You know, this public-private. It's kind of like a public-private um, partnership. But what you what they want to have with that are these secure keys, secure uh, image builds, specifically on what you're what you're building and what you know to build and what you're shipping is true. And then secure execution enclaves. So, and that's all of the stuff that we talk about daily with folks. So, I whether 
you know, whether enterprise, I, I don't think, you know, enterprise blockchain in financial services, I think it will be here and it will then connect. I mean, we could use the buzzwords of interoperability and all those great things, but I think it will do something like that. There are just certain things that require more permissions, right? They just trust, Omid said it earlier, just certain things that require more permission, certain things require less permission. And it's really just a business process. So banks and financial institutions really love this um, process. So it's like, well, if it's more process, it's more secure if it's less process and that's why we can do this you can bring cold storage online um, and that's what we do we, we have that with our financial services ready cloud and that's really exciting for a lot of companies the speed for the liquidity to do that if you're adding all these processes though isn't it sort of just kind of you know rebuilding the existing wheel um, how do you avoid that getting into getting stuck in into into that well, yeah, but th this is this is the old argument of, and I'll I'll shut up after this. But this is now burn burn everything down, or you know live within the system. Right now, you have two different views of well, it's already duct tape and you know chewing gum <laughs> un underneath anyway. So it, it it's not a I, I hear always the, it's not the evolution, it's it's not the revolution, it's the evolution. So I think there will be certain things you'll just need to deal with, and there will you can innovate outside. Um, and things that need to get uh, added and, and brought together will, will be done like that. Um, unless unless you blow up the whole thing, which I don't think is obviously good for anyone. Mm -hmm. I would like to add an anecdote. Uh, unrelated. We love similarly, anecdotes. Similarly, uh, unrelated, but is in, in one of my former jobs, I, I started sort of a revolution product wise, even though it's a very was a very small one. And at one point, my manager stopped me and said, you're very much frustrated because things are not working 100% as you wanted them to work. And he said something which goes with me along the way since then. He said, even a 60% uh, success of a revolution is very much a success. So mm -hmm. I think that for this new asset class of digital assets on public blockchain to be adopted by the small investors, the family owners, uh, going into a bank and saying, I want some Bitcoins uh, in my wallet or in your wallet. That's a very successful type of statement. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting point. Amid, do you have a perspective on that? Well, I think one, enterprise blockchain kind of gets a bad rap. But the number of times someone's like, where is it? I've heard all the hype, all yeah. the results, right? But to me, it's like Bitcoin's 12 years old. No one even called it blockchain in the beginning. In fact, if you look in the Bitcoin white paper, there's no mention of blockchain. Right? So the idea of blockchain as an independent solution itself is like five years old. And then the idea of blockchain built for specific applications in a permission setting, like financial services, is like three and a half years old. So this mm -hmm. idea that like I'm disappointed that this thing that wasn't even an idea until three and a half years ago has not revolutionized the 500 year old banking system is unrealistic and kind of preposterous. The Internet itself took decades to actually impact most of our lives. Uh, and so I think it's coming. It's just hard uh, in, in terms of like, is the infrastructure there? Well, now we have a bunch of different protocols. Then we have service providers like IBM that can help you install it and run it, but you still need internal know-how. And then the other challenge is with most new solutions, the first iteration is you take the existing business model and then you drop it into the new technology and you see what happens, right? So that's like, we used to have newspapers, then we had the World Wide Web. So now we have NewYorkTimes.com, right? still using the ad supported model and everything else. Mm -hmm. You see how that works. And then after a number of years, you're like, okay, well, that's interesting. We learned some things here. We were wrong about some things there. The next iteration, which is like the real fun part, which I don't think enterprise blockchain is quite there yet, is, all right, now that we know the technology works, what's the new business model? Not just business model, but the new process, the new procedure. And that's hard and it's scary because a lot of times it means whoever's important in like this messy middle ground, like the New York Times, is possibly not as important in the true vision of it, right? Because that might be, I don't know, Twitter or Joe Rogan's podcast, whatever the analogy is. Or the scoop. Or the scoop, right. 
So what are the new business models then that we're going to come see enter the threshold in the near term? Oh, I, 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 aside from, aside from like key management being oh, super, darn. That goes the easy answer. super sexy. That's an easy low hanging fruit, Rebecca. I'm not going to let you get off that easy. No, no, no. I didn't want to say that. Um, I'm just wondering how much can I share? Um, you can share everything. Nobody's even listening. I, I think that PayPal has been very open and public about its vision, which is an amazing vision. Like, I'm, I'm so proud to it's be- It's the a best vision. It's phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> honestly, regardless, regardless of, of key management, they're, they're building something that is going to be very inclusive and their wallet is going to consist of assets that right now are not being managed virtually, whether it's identity, tokens, money. And it would be, of course, adhering to all the regulations. But then again, the fact that where I'm at and, uh, you know, in Europe, in the Middle East, in the United States, uh, Africa, and people can communicate and pay each other and identify each other and exchange tokens or any type of value is an amazing revolution. I do hope to actually be taking part in this somehow, hopefully through key management, but uh, this is a really new business model. I don't think any of us has seen that come to life yet. And I do hope that PayPal will succeed because it's so big and so I would say accepted by the industry and by what, the various. What about the PayPal announcement is giving you these sort of um, indications that they're going to be trying to break into things like identity or some of the other business businesses you mentioned? Um, traveling uh, to traveling to Asia. I mean, it's we. It's basically a super app. I mean. Yeah. The, I'm going to, I mean, sorry, Rebecca, I cut you off. No, 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 please do. I, I was hoping you would cut me off. <laughs> I sense that. Uh, so look, um, I want to go back the, uh, I'm going to take a, I'll make a bold prediction on a, on a business model or a company that um, somebody should start. Well, it's probably already happening, but um, so all of the staking, I think there's going to be an explosion around staking when we do ETH 2.0. Um, and I think that banks will start to, in the same way that you saw, like Coinbase uh, gobble up Tagomi and you'll see like, you know, Fidelity being really good with custody and now everybody's gonna start doing custody. They will have some version of, hey, now that you have, uh, cause it's, it's gonna be s searching for yield. So people will be searching for returns. And if you're getting point, whatever it is, zero, 0.1% in your uh, checking account, now the bank can say, don't leave us, don't leave us just yet, but wait, there's more. Uh, you can stake, we'll help you stake uh, your Ethereum. You don't have 32 ETH? Great, um, here's, uh, here's, give us 16, give us 10. Will, and now you're doing, they're becoming a market maker on some level and, and they're providing those staking services for, for pools and things like that. So they're doing it for you. I mean, that, that's one way of keeping you around. If, if I was, a, if I was a, a bank, I would do that. Yeah, Are any of the banks that you're engaging with thinking earnestly about that? Uh, uh, I think that we're, we're talking, I mean, I'll, we're talking more from us, we'll do whatever they want, right? We're, we're talking infrastructure, we're, we, we can float that to them, but it's really on them to drive it. Mm -hmm. Ahmed? I was just gonna say, like, who better to do staking than an institution of trust? Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, I would imagine, as is my experience, if you go to most people who work in a bank's custody business and say how they feel about staking, they're not quite there yet, um, but they'll get there. Uh, and and it, it goes back, I think, to the idea of key management. And Frank, you said like custody is a terrible business in of itself, but it enables all sorts of other interesting like staking. Adam, I said it was a boring room. business. But it is also a terrible business as I mean, well. It, yeah, because we've seen the fees keep going down for custody itself. Maybe they'll go to zero eventually, but the expenses are very high because it's expensive to protect people's bearer assets. Um, but someone's going to have to lose for all of this to become true. And that's, that's the hard thing, right? So I'm really glad that Rebecca brought up PayPal, which seems to be making a lot of interesting moves. Mm -hmm. um, but... PayPal makes, I believe, close to 90% of its revenues from merchant processing fees, right? Like the standard 
30 cents plus 2.9 percent hmm. uh, which i increasingly think in this day and age is preposterous right like if you're selling stuff on ebay and you have a million dollars revenues and 30 grand of it goes to your payment processor uh but all right so here are stable coins right like why doesn't paypal as of tomorrow just let people use die or usdc or even well, their own stable coin or issue their own stable coin right many benefits to doing so one downside because the fee structure the, the business model of stable coins is completely different so they'll have to figure out some way to generate new revenues that's no longer the merchant processing fee and that's not just their their problem it's like any legacy financial company yeah. that's entering this domain the reason we're entering this domain is one, it's, 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 it's better, it's more efficient, programmable money, 24 seven payments, yada, yada, yada. Let's not forget it's cheaper. That's their profit margin. So to me, the interesting open question, I don't have the answer to. We can say who some of the winners are going to be, right? Like I think the crypto native companies, they came ready to play uh, because they already live in the world where there is open competition. Nobody has a stake, wrong term. Nobody has a hold on uh, Bitcoin trading in the same way that like DTC accounts for 99% of US stock trades. We can start a competitor to them. Good luck to us, but we can start a crypto exchange. So the crypto native companies come from this world where they're used to open competition and they have to evolve, evolve, evolve. Uh, but as traditional companies, banks, PayPal, even fintechs, they enter this world not having some of the regular moats that they do, be they regulatory or just network effects. Uh, it'll be interesting to see like what the fallout from all of that is. Mm -hmm. There's also been some significant changes. We kind of alluded to this earlier on in the conversation, but some fairly significant changes in the regulatory landscape, especially relative uh, to 2017, right? We've seen some interesting developments out of Wyoming, um, a sort of banking framework um, from which we've seen firms like Kraken and Avanti launch um, offerings in the banking sphere. How significant is this towards um, driving further enterprise blockchain initiatives? And is this something that people are even looking at within the more uh, larger hollowed halls of financial institutions, or or is it just like you know, Wyoming is just Wyoming, just like South Dakota. This might be my um, elitist East Coast uh, thinking creeping through my question. Well, yeah, I think maybe more relevant is the fact that Square got an industrial loan license earlier this year, which is a kind of a banking license. Uh, or that Brian Brooks is talking about a national payment charter in the US. That's phase one of his plan. Phase two is then those who have that charter get access to the Fed's balance sheet and payment systems. So, which, which is like huge, right? It's, that's the synthetic CBDC for us who are nerds, but it means that unlike your deposit in your local commercial bank, your deposit at PayPal is 100% backed by reserves at the Fed. Um, should PayPal get that license and go down this road? So I think what we are seeing though is regulatory modes, the licenses and all of that are becoming more available to everyone. So you can no longer have a business model that's primarily based on the fact that you have that privilege and others don't. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, Rebecca, you have had an interest in Wyoming. I forget exactly why, though. We talked about it last time. Uh, we've been in discussions with them. I think it's interesting, again, I'm a geek in that sense, so we've been discussing with them the key management topic, naturally. Um, we see that as an example in other, I would say, uh, districts, not only in the US, also in Europe and in Japan, because we have customers you know, all around the world. So we do see the regulators 
of various types and various sizes, pretty much exploring key management. And it's very interesting for us to see how cautious they are on one side, um, how explorative they are on the you know, other side, pretty much exploring what is out there and what they should recommend. So for us, it has been a journey, pretty much trying to convince them to even go to that city, uh, a journey that has been very successful, I must say. But for us, it, it's really interesting to see them sort of exploring, writing essays, writing articles, uh, legislating, uh, currently working with HSMs and multi-sig. And this is why one of the reasons we have this great partnership with IBM, working together with their uh, HPVS platform uh, and its HSM level four type of uh, uh, hardware security module. So it's really interesting simply to see those legislators uh, questioning, exploring past technologies, acknowledging the need for a change, and writing down that need. And the uh, federations, the various federations, are simply adopting that. We see Germany adopting its regulations. We see the Japanese FSA adopting its regulation, exploring now the MPC. So it is working, but pretty much like a slow, I would say, wave. Uh, so driven from the bottom. So it's a bottom-up type of influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I'm going to add on, you know, our so we've had a nice front row seat to Wyoming as well, because our sister company, uh, Promontory, was hired to write the rules and, and regulation, right, from the, the Wyoming um, Division of Banking. So that's been really exciting, right, as, as Rebecca's saying. I think there's like me, there's two camps when I speak to clients. There's people that are saying some version of we're excited for the speedy it's lighter than the bit license, it's faster. Um, you know, we get that there's no lending, you know, the, the specific rules for digital assets. And this is mirrored when you see like, I think it was Signature Bank started accepting assets and they went from 52 million to 2. billion in <laughs> under, assets under management in like six months or some ridiculous number. So that's, there's a group that's all, all on board. And then you get like a little bit of the you know, old guard that's like, the United States, you know, it's specifically around the United States, which is we are the, the most efficient markets in the world because we're do very clearly doing massive federal regulation. And that's why money comes here because of that, as Omid said, some version of that, the trust. So I think there's a couple of different camps and Wyoming will be upset if uh, the Fed does something and makes it null and void. That's, that's the way it goes. But there, there's a there's a risk for going first, right? There always is. Um, someone just dropped an interesting question. and. We're, we're getting towards the tail end of the conversation, so feel free to send more our way. Um, it, it seems more of like a, it was the hot summer trend, but you know, still obviously top of mind for many people. DeFi, how do you think DeFi applications are going to be managed, maintained by larger companies such as banks in the future if they are majorly decentralized? I think that we already have a partial answer to that, which is as the bridge to the existing system. So like other than ETH, uh, the, among the biggest um, deposit assets in the DeFi world are ones provided by either stablecoin issuers or you know, Bitcoin on-ramp providers, so like USDC, Tether, wrapped Bitcoin. So this is a role that I think will only grow because if you could somehow get treasury bonds onto into DeFi, you can have like much more efficient, much more transparent repo market. Um, but until the treasury department decides to issue security tokens on Ethereum, the only way to do that is you're going to need a trusted large balance sheet. Say we're going to buy a bunch of treasury bonds and issue tokens, you know, just like a stable coin or wrapped Bitco. So I actually think there's a huge opportunity there, and I expect it to be begin to be filled in the next year. But there's or always going to be an opportunity. The question is, well, there's demand at the moment. Yeah, too. yeah. And will the banks do anything about it, even if there is that opportunity there? Again, future business banks. It's some version of right now. DeFi is the wild west, right? 2017 was all the ICOs. So. It's, I don't know how many how many wallets are on Compound, not like 10,000. I mean, it's like very, it's not like millions of people doing this. And so somebody reads an article, I, I'll give you the best example. Like two years ago, my father and I were trying to figure out like the gap. In other words, I would read an article and then like 
you know, months later, months, months later, he would say something like, hey, I read something in my financial article about this thing. Okay, yield farming came up and I read about it. The next day he's like, hey, what's up with yield farming? I was like, how do you know about yield farming? He's like, should I put my IRA in it? And I'm like, so it's getting, it's much closer. And so if I'm a bank, I same thing with staking. I say, look, hey, looking for yield. Here's a risk, whatever that percentage is, we'll do all of that. We're going to basically be those trusted, like, because you, you go try to figure out uni or try to go figure out these things. I did. It didn't end well. Exactly. So it's not, it's not the easiest on-ramp. And if you want to do that for retail investors, which I think crypto, I think we can agree is driven by retail investors at this point, at least mostly, um, then you're going to have to make it much, much easier for people. And the race will be, I mean, I think the... Private companies will probably win this, but it, uh, at least the non-banks, they're going to be faster. But if banks can say, I'm going to make it super easy for you to do this, why not? Also, Take don't it. underestimate the power of balance sheet. Mm -hmm. like all else right. being equal, a lot of these services, you would rather be provided by a trillion dollar balance sheet than a billion dollar balance sheet. One, it can scale a lot more. Two, if something goes wrong, there's a lot more buffer there to absorb it than like, you know, if some crypto startup did the same thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would like just to comment that infrastructure wise, we see the banks and the larger institutions talking about staking DFI uh, or stable coins, but actually at a much more basic level of adopting, I would say, what the ICOs of the various types did in 2017. So to, just to echo what Adam said for most of our customers and the prospects that we're talking with, uh, DFI is now the wild, wild west. It sure feels like it, especially when I got my face ripped off on those, on those trade, on those gas fees. What, 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 pair, what pairs were you trading, Frank? <sighs> it's a dangerous question. <laughs> <laughs> Go to that pool quickly. Frank was secretly get out, so, get so out of there. That was, uh, <laughs> that was definitely top, um, bigly. Big I lost so much money. I'm so poor now. <laughs> That's why I have to do these webinars. Getting paid. Don't, don't forget to share your Bitcoin. My referral here. link. Yeah. Donations accepted. Seriously. That's great. That's we'll great. tweet. We'll tweet for food. No, just kidding. Things are fine. Um, <laughs> I'm just dramatic. Very dramatic. I love it. Um, well, I think we are. We are just about out of time. Uh, I guess we can kind of like wrap things up with everyone's big, maybe controversial forecast for maybe the end of the year or what, what you're expecting, at least in the near term, that maybe other folks aren't. We'll start with you, Rebecca. Ooh, I, I don't know about controversies. Um, I, you know what? If, if, if I see the 10 big banks in production with their blockchain, infrastructures working, that would be a controversy on its own. Yeah. Very unlikely, I think. Yeah, I agree. Unlikely, but still, Ahmed? Uh, very unlikely anytime soon. But I think you might see one bank. I don't know if it's one of the biggest banks, maybe a tier two bank, make the plunge with custody, either offering it, building a relationship with a sub-custodian or buying a sub-custodian. And that might really start to move things. I don't, I think that could happen. I think we could definitely see some M&A activity. Mr. Mastrielli. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to keep it enterprise. I have a lot of predictions. Um, my prediction market, my fees, much like FTX is up to a million dollars on my prediction market. But I think, um, I'll say within within financial services on on the prediction not only of custody but they will let you um, access markets. You, you will they will custody and by the middle of next year, some bank, one bank, will will be able to have you do a direct drop down whether you're doing it from your IRA or something, and you will be in directly from that. And uh, yeah, you'll you'll be into the system, and it'll be through a stablecoin of some sort. We shall see. And when, uh, if something like that happens, we'll have you back on to chat about it. And there's no penalty if I'm wrong. This, I mean, citizen general, there's no penalty. Right. 
There's Nuriel no Rubini just reversed himself. So I know. Adam Mastrelli can do that too. Rubini, Mastrelli, Shaparo. I mean, we're like, yeah. you know, whatever. It's, uh, the three musketeers. Musketeers. Yeah. Musket. Yeah, took a sigh. Took a sigh. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in. If you have any thoughts, concerns, questions, or suggestions for next time, you know where to find me. Thanks, guys.